for many of us, me included, falling in love with orchestral music goes back to first hearing that sound of a hundred or maybe more musicians playing full blast. Whether it's Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, Beethoven's Fifth or Ninth Symphonies, the operas of Verdi and Wagner, we cannot get enough of a mad, bad and dangerously loud band. And it's not just us listeners who love the volume turned up to 11. A lot of composers want nothing more than to make our ears metaphorically bleed. So it's no surprise that when Vivaldi or Berlioz or Richard Strauss want to make some noise, they often choose to do it in the same way, by creating the perfect musical storm. Storms give us weather at its most dramatic, and what is not to love about that for a composer? But creating stormy musical weather is more than just a question of relying on clichés, making things loud, or putting the music in a minor key, or even concocting some racy, whizzing themes. For the very best composers, storms are a window into a whole new musical world, a place where they find new depths of human drama, tragedy, conflict and resolution. Dr Karen Aplin from Oxford University's Department of Physics combines a career as an atmospheric scientist with a love of classical music. She's catalogued and analysed depictions of weather in music from the 17th century to the present day. I had the idea quite a long time ago and I realised that in some of the orchestras I was playing with, the pieces we were doing quite often featured weather. And so I started listing all the pieces and we came with quite a long list. What is it that attracts composers to storms then rather than sunshine? I think they like storms because they're dramatic and because there's scope for mimicry. I think because you can recreate the sounds of a storm in an orchestra, whereas if you want to recreate sunshine, I mean, you can and people have, but you have to think a bit harder about it. And so also because storms are dramatic, that means you can use them in a, to, well, in telling a story to signify sort of emotion and drama in, in people's lives or in the story that you're trying to tell. For centuries, composers have been trying to invent and discover new sounds that would suggest wind In Baroque times, a lot of scrubbing on the strings. Graeme Sheen, principal bassoon of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. The bassoon actually is maybe a little bit inside the storm, but what's interesting is there's often something for the bassoons to play in the lead up to the storm and the dying away, because that's something that composers have also had to, to deal with. You don't just have a storm, it has to develop and then it has to recede, just like it would in nature. then the musical cliches of the storm what is it that's going to be your tick box of if you want to create a perfect storm I have to do x y and z what are the ingredients yeah I think the musical cliches that you might pick are um, low notes if the thunder is the most musically easy storm to represent so you use the low instruments for thunder so typically the timpani and I'm a double bassist and one of the things I thought was oh we're always having to be thunder so you know and you use tremolando so you scrub the string to to copy the sounds of thunder and then fast The strings and wind instruments usually play fast notes to represent the rain falling and drumming down, and the percussion section can kick in as well. Chromatic scales are very useful in storm music, and and a lot of storms do have a lot of chromatic passages suggesting this constant undulation and... uh, Impotence, you know, the lack of control one would sort of feel in a, you know, if you were in a small boat in this sort of um, storm. We often think of painters, landscape painters, depicting storms, mm. novelists depicting storms. What is it that musicians can bring to bear and how they create a storm? How does the musical imagination work when it comes to storms? Firstly, as I said, there's mimicry. So you can use the instruments of the orchestra to represent a storm. Also, there are special instruments that have been devised to represent storms, which such as a thunder sheet, which is a big sheet metal that you suspend in percussion section and you sort of um, hit it and it makes a noise like thunder. And also there's a wind machine, which is a sort of roll that's covered with a sheet that you can rotate and it makes a howling noise like the wind. Wind. Shall we go to Thunder yeah. Corner? Yeah. So this 
basically it's bell percussion in Acton in London and we're in the stores of their hire department because although most orchestras own their own timpani and percussion equipment it's impossible to own every conceivable instrument that you can have. This is Mick Doran, principal percussionist with English National Opera. He's brought us to Bell Percussion, where you can find everything from mallets and marimbas to timpani, drum kits, cymbals and a whole lot more. So to my right is a wind machine. And the wind machine is a large drum made of wooden slats which around which is stretched a piece of canvas and there's a handle at one end so that I can turn the drum around rather like someone drawing a tombola at a village fete but when the slats rub against the canvas it gives you this sound and the faster you turn it the more frantic it gets. And that's exactly the sound that you'll hear in the Alpine Symphony. Of all the storms in classical music, none is arguably more chillingly real than the one we get hit with in Richard Strauss's Alpine Symphony. As a boy, Strauss was part of a group of climbers who lost their way in the Alps, caught in a violent storm while they were heading up a mountain. Strauss's memory, transformed into a musical evocation of that experience, takes us through every stage of a storm, from the ominous drum roll at the start, little raindrops, flashes of lightning, and then there's a wind machine as we get into the eye of the storm itself. Mick Doran again. The Alpine Symphony, the storm in there, not only has got this enormous orchestra and creating an extraordinary effect through the use of conventional instruments, but he then puts the icing on the cake with a wind machine and a thunder sheet, and so it's all there in that one. This huge sheet of metal here is a thunder sheet, and it's made of aluminium, very fine aluminium. It's very flexible. If I if I bend it with my hands, you see it, it's very flexible. It's about six foot long and approximately three foot wide. And what I do is hold the edge towards the center and wobble it. And so it does a pretty good impersonation of distant thunder. And again, like the wind machine, um, the more excited you get playing it, the more excited the sound comes out. I think it's an amazing piece. I was very lucky to perform it at the Festival Hall and I was playing the wind machine and I sat waiting for the storm which is about halfway through the piece sitting behind the French horn section I've never experienced anything like it the sheer drama of being in the middle of this enormous huge machine that's pumping out a fantastic sound beautiful music that goes from the quietest pianissimo to the loudest fortissimo and it's such an extraordinary piece of music um, one of my favourites. Lightning, quite often the piccolo is used for lightning. And Why, because it's high and shrieky? It's shrieky, yeah. I mean, not that, of course, lightning makes a sound, but I think if you've ever been close to a thunderstorm, you'll know that it get, can get a little bit scary because thunder and lightning... The reason that they happen at different times is because sound and light move at different speeds. So light moves very quickly, so you see the lightning, then you hear the thunder later. So the difference between the thunder and the lightning tells you how far away the storm is. 
So if you're too close to a thunderstorm, thunder and lightning will be very close together. So in the Alpine Symphony, Strauss has what I think must be a lightning bolt with a shrieky piccolo and then almost immediately a big clap of thunder and that really sums up the kind of, ooh, um, that's a bit close for comfort. You know, you might imagine your hair standing on end perhaps because you're in the electric field of the thunderstorm. Richard Strauss wasn't the only musician who needed the extremes of a particular climate to inspire him. Composers from across Europe and the States have often found that when there's low pressure, it induces a kind of composing frenzy. I wondered, though, if there was a particular kind of climate that made the perfect musical storm. Just how much does it matter if the storms you experience are violent and climactic or just damp and miserable? Karen Aplin. There are two major different types of storm in weather and in the types of storms represented in music. So we have convective storms and frontal storms. So a convective storm is the type of storm that will generate thunder and lightning, which is usually due to it being a warm day and the air rising and there being lots of motion in the air and eventually a big thundercloud developing. The other type of storm, the frontal storm, is more to do with the bigger weather systems. Uh, we get a lot of them in the UK coming in off the Atlantic, so when you see the weather and you see the isobars packed close together and the fronts, that is the frontal type of storm and that quite often comes in from the west into northern Europe and brings wind and rain, occasionally thunder and lightning, but usually just wind and rain. So Richard Strauss is always going to give you a convective storm and Benjamin yep. Britten's always going to give yep. you a frontal that is, storm. that is what we found. The storm from Peter Grimes is uh, a piece that we do a lot, actually. It's often done as an encore by BBC Symphony Orchestra. And I must say, I've never become tired of it. It, it. it always seems so original. The rhythms and the way the phrases are broken up, you know, that's, that's very exciting. Also, the, the, the orchestration is absolutely immaculate. There's that little stretto all the time, you know, as we say, where the rhythms gather speed. This effect of the waves, you know, lashing in sort of contrary directions. And then there's a wonderful bit that I always look forward to. I always get um, slightly sort of goose pimply feeling in uh, when the trombones are playing da 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 dee, da 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 dee da, da 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 dee. And it's very close harmony, low down. And that's really like, you know, this tremendous swell. The storm from the Four Sea Interludes from Peter Grimes is a musical storm. It's aggressive, but it's still musical. You haven't got someone clapping a thunder sheet or winding up a wind machine. But it's very possible to create a very dramatic storm without using any effects, just using conventional musical instruments. My personal favourite is the Peter Grimes storm. I think that's really original. And I think Britain was quite constrained in instrumentation he could use because he was writing for a pit orchestra. And there's a very sort of British type of, of weather represented, which is the kind of, oh, it's been raining, it's been terrible all day. Oh, it's, oh, it's a bit brighter now. And then for about five minutes, oh, it's raining again. And there is a moment of that. I think that's really original. <laughs> I have recently heard those Britain Sea interludes in the concert hall again for the first time in ages, and I'd forgotten how ferocious the storm is that Britain unleashes on us, a brilliant allegory for the emotional turbulence of his operatic anti-hero Peter Grimes. And it's this question of what life is going to throw at us that we all ask ourselves every day, and that a great depiction of a musical storm goes some way to answering. No wonder such a staggeringly wide range of composers have created their own storms in music. Everyone from Vorjak, Grieg, Mendelssohn and Liszt to Gershwin, Glazunov, Bax and Purcell. 
And it is not just instrumental music that gets to whip itself up into a frenzy. How about this chorus? It's from one of Handel's Shandos anthems, and it turns the words of a psalm into a fizzingly dramatic evocation of a storm. The quotation reads, The earth trembled and quaked, the very foundations also of the hills shook and removed. He cast forth lightnings and gave his thunder and destroyed them. If I had to pick a favourite, I have always particularly loved the storm from Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, the way it slowly reveals that dark weather brewing on the horizon. There are deep rumblings in the basses and cellos, then the violins come in with these little offbeat figures like raindrops falling. And then suddenly it's over our heads, the timps, the full orchestra raging, and then it subsides. There's the warm softness of a flute like rays of sunshine. But does it actually ring true to someone who knows how real storms behave? Well, I talked to BBC weatherman Stav Danaos and I asked him which musical storms rang truest for him. They always often start off quite quiet and formidable sounds. That feeling of the sky darkening, the air falling lights. So after a sunny, warm day, suddenly dark clouds begin to build. Feel that oppressive feeling of a storm building, and the music's got to depict that really. And then, as the storm begins to approach, with distant thunder becoming like getting louder, lightning strikes becoming visible, first few drops of rain coming down. Then the rain in full force, lashing with a strong wind, close lightning strikes. So that's when I think the music should be at full speed, really loud, dramatic, piercing at points, and then beginning to taper off as well. But you get the whole scene of the rain lashing, the roads turning to rivers, uh, flash flooded ground. The Grand Canyon, pounded by thunder and lightning during a nighttime desert storm. That was the cloudburst from Ferdi Grofe's Grand Canyon Suite, a highly realistic and I think utterly brilliant portrayal of a storm from a 20th century master of orchestration. So, who in the end is the stormiest composer? Certainly one Baroque musician has a reasonable claim to that title. Vivaldi was the... I counted up the storm composers. Vivaldi wrote the most storms, and he did both types, which I think is probably because Italy gets both types of weather because it's got a long coastline, so it gets the storm at sea type, and then also the inland frontal storm. In the four seasons, he's got... I think there's a storm in spring and in summer, and I think they're both the thunder and lightning type. But then he wrote the storm at sea which was another orchestral piece, which is clearly the frontal type. And then he had a vocal piece. That's about a storm at sea, I think, as well, so that's the frontal type.
So there you have it, your indispensable guide to how to cook up the perfect musical storm. Look up to the mountains and down into the canyons if you want ferocious turbulence. If you live in wet and windy Britain, start genning up on your frontal storms. Never panic when you get lost in the Alps. It's great musical material. And never hold back on using a wind machine or the old thunder sheet if you want to create maximum impact. Actually, on second thoughts, maybe best to hold back on that thunder sheet, as Mick Doran explains. Of course, there's a famous storm scene in The Flying Dutchman, which uh, I <laughs> had a bit of a, a moment on. There was a very attractive lady backstage who I was trying to impress. And we'd finished, it was hugely successful. And as I walked away, I was still looking at this young lady and trying to show off a bit, I tripped over the edge of the stand holding the thunder sheet and <laughs> fell flat on my face. Not only did I very much not impress her, I also did not impress the conductor.